So our next speaker has been a regular megalithomania for many years. She's a master dowser, a geomancer, a writer, and a healer, and she's been producing many amazing books on the subjects. Today she's going to be talking about her latest research, looking at the mysteries of Stanton Drew and the goddess traditions associated with them, as well as some remarkable astronomical and lunar alignments that she's uncovered there. So please give a warm megalithomania welcome to Maria Wheatley. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. Isn't it wonderful being here with these groundbreaking research done by people like Andy and Hugh? It's a, it's a real honor to be here. We've heard Kathy and JJ talk about the goddess as being something out there, like in the heavens, like the moon, something away from us. I'm going to show you how in the Bronze Age, women and men were treated very differently in death and how women, living women, such as myself and you, we became the goddess in the landscape as well, and how burials were very, very different. Also, there's a time, a very special time, that only happens, uh, as we know here, uh, every 18.61 years when the winter solstice coincides with dark moon. And dark moon represents an aspect of the goddess. So I'm going to show you this protracted ritual uh, with the rising of the moon and the uh, sun on the same day and how that extends to three to five days at places you can see at Avebury and Stanton Drew. Then I'm going to show you female earth energies and how the moon influences these female earth energies and produces amazing shapes that JJ's just spoken about of the goddess, but these are in the land. Gaia produces the triple spiral. So we're going to get going. Um, find out more about me at esotericcollege.com. Uh, That's one of my websites, or the AveryExperience.co.uk. We're going to start with the moon. The moon uh, is this, in this phase, is dark moon. Now, during the winter solstice, we think of places where the sun rises is just to do with the sun. I'm going to show you it isn't, because at dawn, preceding the winter solstice sunrise, you can see dark moon. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. But before I get to Stanton Drew, I'm going to show you Avebury. Because Avebury's been excavated far, far more than Stanton Drew. In fact, we're not going to focus on the stone circles themselves, but on the avenues. Alexander Keeler, as many of you will know, when he arrived at the avenue, the West Kennet Stone Avenue, it was a mess. There's only two stones standing, 33 and 4B. And I'm going to show you the magic of 4B and how I think people entered ancient sites at Karnak, uh, from Karnak rather, to Avebury, to Stanton Drew. So Keeler, shown here, he, he restored all of the avenue, basically. And he told us it was a processional way for people to walk. And how many people here have walked the avenue? Loads of us, but I don't think that's what was happening at Avebury because Alexander Keeler, in his own notes, omitted what he found. And I'm going to be sharing that with you because I think Keeler, well, he was a man for one, but I think Keeler was deliberately withholding the evidence by saying, Look at what I've done, look at the avenue, walk the avenue in the footsteps of your ancestors, he said, but they didn't. And we're going to be looking at the avenue. It's beautiful. I mean, he did restore it very, very well. Uh, and it's lovely, like I say, uh, to walk. But we're going to be looking at the avenue through a Neolithic temple, which I call a Neolithic temple. I'm going to give you the evidence for it, and I'm going to give you the archaeological evidence as well. It's Neolithic, so it's much older than this part of the avenue as well. So when we have a look at an aerial shot of the avenue, we can see it goes down in pairs, except for what's known as stone 30B. 
Keeler knew it was impaired, the avenue, as it got towards the end. There was a massive gap, a massive gap, no stone. Why? What were the ancients up to there? Why did they leave this huge gap? But Keeler wanted it to look symmetrical. So he placed the stones in pairs. So imagine now we're down the far end of the avenue. Here. And that's where there's this big gap. And it's for a, a wonderful astronomical alignment. So what did Keeler omit when it comes to, to avenues? It is simple. The evidence that he had was there was no compression marks whatsoever down the middle of the avenue. The compression marks were on the outside. And I'm going to be showing you the two different types of earth energy there. We all know from Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst's fame that the Michael current in its meandering course sets the width of the avenue. But there's another feminine uh, energy either side. That's what the ancients were walking on. Additionally to that, what Keeler found was at the bottom end of the avenue is littered with boulders of sarsen stones. But it all looks so clear today, doesn't it? Had a big tidy up session. I really love archaeologists like Maria Gimbutas, but modern day archaeologists as well. Uh, so I'm going to give a shout to Michelle Turner and to Lisa Brown, two women that have really inspired me. And Michelle Turner, she's associated with Charco Canyon and the archaeological society there and how they're reevaluating the roads of Charco Canyon, a wonderful site in Four Corners in America, is that the so-called roads or avenues weren't. Because what, they, what they've discovered with these roads, and I think this is what's going on at Avery and Stanton Drew, is I'll be coming to, at Charco, they place shrines in the middle of the, the so-called road. But not just any sort of shrine. They deliberately broke up a pot, and as we see, humans went into pots. They deliberately broke up these pots in deliberately side shards and placed them there. And this is what they were doing at Avebury. So we're going to have a now a look at what uh, Mark Gillins and Josh Pollard say is a midden. And a midden, in kind of archaeological standard talk, is a rubbish dump. <laughs> So we're now at stone 30B, and Keeler made it flat. All the marker stones that he placed along the avenue at Avebury are like a pyramid shape, except for one flat stone at the avenue. It shouldn't be there. It should have been omitted and left out. And it creates this very, very large gap. And as we can see, that very large gap targets two uh, astronomical events, the winter solstice sunrise and the southern a uh, minor moonrise as well. So this is what it's really focusing on. In between these angles of, uh, of the sunrise, we have the moon. And that's what we're going to be looking at at Stanton Drew. And it's a protracted ritual. And I'll show you how they were walking the landscape uh, as well. So here we have really the, the energies of the earth here, which I'll show you later. But the moonrise, uh, uh, especially, I don't know if anybody was at Avebury for the uh, Southern Minor Moonrise last time around. Ooh, you've got a bit of a wait then. <laughs> It's been there in 2015. It was a little bit cloudy, but the, the energies were great. And I'm going to show you how the moon changes uh, Earth energy. So you're going to have to wait to 2035. Uh, we've got a, a major moonrise coming, but that's uh, in a couple of years' time. This one's a bit different. So I want you to anchor that thought in. We've got the, the, the southern uh, moonrise coming up, and we've got the winter solstice, because they were fused together uh, in a moment. But stones, they're very subtly shaped at Avebury rather than the dramatic lozenger shapes at Stonehenge. And have a walk around and you can see that they've been angled and people like uh, Ter Terence Meaden suggest they're faces. Some people think they're animals. It could, it could have been both. But Tom Lethbridge, he was a master dancer that I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, in the past. He said that if you applied pressure to a stone, like a dress and more, 
of a stone like that, you can put in your charge, he called it a bionic charge, into the stones. So you can tell who the masons were in effect. Okay? Now at Stonehenge, the, the trilophons in the, in the middle, and quite a few stones at Avebury hold a female bionic charge. So if we use Lethbridge's way of who worked the stones, then there were a lot of female women masons. And where do you see that at Stonehenge? It's all men banging stones against stones. Again, women have been, I think, underplayed because what really annoys me is we've all heard of the Amesbury Archer, haven't we? Yep, the, Bos the Boscombe Bowman, the Stonehenge Shaman. But, yeah, all men. But next to the, well, quite close to the Stonehenge Shaman, in my research, I found a, a woman that was a shaman. All of her standard artifacts that she was carrying showed that she was a midwife, but she's nameless. Next to the Bushman, uh, from the Bushbarrow Man, uh, gold finds. Next to him, a woman that came from East Riding who had more power than him as well. So uh, again, you know, it's all, all the guys. But we're going to, I'm going to show you how women were literally kept alive. And they were what's called a individual, and men were individuals. Now when we come to this midden site again, I want to show you it in, uh, in depth, because it deliberately has a zigzag shape, and they have ten very large pits. And I think it reflects Cassiopeia in the night sky, which authors like Robert Graves, for example, says could have been the British goddess Dawn, a kind of mother uh, of gods here. But I mean, I don't think that would have been her name then, but it's just kind of identifying from through the, the Neolithic. And they were deliberately put in artifacts here. It wasn't a midden because there was hundreds and hundreds of the most beautiful artifacts, flints and axe heads. And axes represent the female form, the protectress of the dead that JJ mentioned uh, earlier. Interestingly as well, and these are beautifully finished axes. They're in Devizes Museum. They're of jade. They're, they're, they're truly spectacular. And a discerning eye along the avenue, well, you'll see the polisher where the, these stones were probably polished at Avery in situ. I show people uh, that. So I think it's associated to the stars as well. But they were deliberately putting trees into the ground there. And the trees were blackthorn, and they were hazel, and they were hawthorn. Well, they're the, the tree calendar of the later druids. So I think there's some symbolism with Oum going way, way back into tree calendar and to the Neolithic period. But this is one of uh, the styles of axes that you found deposited each side of this shrine temple that's called a rubbish dump. But if you're, you, if you're putting rubbish into the ground, it's normally broken uh, deposits, and they were beautiful axes. So we know that it was a feminine form in between that area of uh, that temple space, between roughly stone 27 of the avenue, if you want to go there, and stone 33. And I'm sure to the, the ancients, it could have been like the, again, a much later Later goddess like the Morrigan. She's a protectress of the dead. So who's she protecting at uh, Avebury then? If indeed this is a protectress of the death, she has to be protecting something in the landscape. So I thought, well, again, what Keeler omitted about the avenue was all of the ritual burials there and how the burials were placed all the way down uh, the avenue. Because even in his notes, he says he doesn't want to scare women and small children. So, uh, so we, we miss that out again. And when we have a real look at who's buried along the avenue, it's all men. So that you have this female form in, in, uh, in the axe heads placed each side. Later, we're going to see the women uh, themselves with uh, the avenue. But when we go to see Keeler's plan, we see that there was ritual burial after ritual burial after ritual burial uh, in the landscape. And it's stone 18B. It's a small discern. Not a, it's a kind of stone you'd almost miss. That's where an adolescent boy had cuts that, again, looked like Owen cuts, lines. Uh, you can, you know, Google Owen, uh, all on his uh, femur bone. 
And so they, they were sort of almost becoming the guardians of the Avery uh, landscape. So I think this is what the protectress was, was guarding. And a pop, in all probability, it's believed that these people that became these uh, guardians probably wanted to become uh, a guardian. They were all young and healthy. There was nothing to say that, you know, they, they, died, they didn't die of natural causes. They were probably ceremonially uh, sacrificed. It's called merge into the landscape. And that's what I think uh, the men uh, we're doing here along the avenue itself. So if the people of the past weren't walking the avenue and they were walking down the sides of the avenue, which is where the compression marks say, then you'll be walking on these bodies either side and we'll see the, the beautiful earth energies that are there. But let's say at the sanctuary, that which is associated to the Avery complex on Overton Hill, I'm sure lots of us have been to the sanctuary. It was found by Maud Cunnington, and uh, she restored it by just putting concrete markers where a former concentric stone circle used to be placed. So what she noticed there, when we come to, uh, to the next slide, is that when you have a look at the sanctuary, You've got the avenue here, but there's this bit here. There's another looking like it's two avenues, double in its course. Uh, Hamish Miller says this bit was where the Michael current flows into uh, the sanctuary. What I proposed many years ago was I think there was another avenue coming down from the other sanctuary, hitting the Faulkner Circle, which is a, a stone circle of 12. Here. So I think there's a long lost avenue that that's how people were coming down to the avenue, then walking up the sides, okay? Uh, and the energy, maybe it was the goddess entering the site, like at Charco Canyon, and places like uh, in Babylon where they had rooms for the gods and the goddesses. So I think it was energy coming down, and maybe it was too sacred for, for, you know, for humans for some reason at this point in time, uh, nonetheless. So how do we enter a stone circle? I'm on the outside of the avenue now, uh, and I'm not going down like the everyday tourist out down the middle. One thing that uh, I think the ancients were ingenious about is clearing up our mess. <laughs> what do I mean about that? If you imagine you're going to go into a stone circle with all of your emotional baggage, did the ancients do that? I don't think they did. I'm going to show you stone 4B now. And this dowsing technique was taught to me by Italian uh, dowsers who looked very closely in how you enter a Catholic church in northern Italy. So I'd just like to give a shout to Gabriel, uh, Victorio, and Alberto for showing me these techniques. Because they said there was a neutral zone that you'd enter the church, and it kind of clears your energy field, and then you enter the sanctity of the church. Uh, without taking your kind of emotional baggage with you. And I thought, that's a wonderful idea. I wonder if the ancients were doing that, and if so, can I find a stone? And after kind of some research and looking into places like uh, Karnak Temple with a, a row of sphinxes like an avenue and at Avebury, what we discovered was by this stone here, uh, stone 4B, in situ, never been removed or re-erected by, by Keeler. It has its energies intact. One thing I've noticed about the intact stones at Avebury, Stonehenge, and elsewhere, is they hold on to their power. It's almost like they have so much sacredness, nobody's ever touched them. So we are honored to have this neutral stone. Now where, I'm going to just do show you where the energy comes out of the ground, and we've measured this energy. Just there, so it's right kind of on the, the edge of the stone. And bear in mind, uh, with this stone, tourists walk this side. But if you're going on the outside, it would be the other side. 
And on the other side of that stone, you have an actual seat and a ledge. It's not just the devil's chair at Avebury that has uh, these features. So out of the ground here is pouring literally negative ions. And it's almost like bathing you so you can stand in that energy zone. And I've taken hundreds of people to these points, and they do feel that they've been sort of cleansed in one way. You go round the other side, and then you sit on the chair to get your uh, kind of energy field uh, in, intact. Uh, I know uh, Andy Collins and uh, Hugh have mentioned Rodney Hale. Many years ago, I did some tests with, uh, with Rodney through radiation levels at the sanctuary and also along the West Kennet Stone Avenue. And Rodney's always on the road of caution, isn't he, Andy? <laughs> God love him. And uh, he said, we, we need to do these tests again. Well, I did them several times, and there was a difference. But the, it's opposite to the sanctuary. You have a higher radiation level at the center. Then it drops out, as it were, to the outside. It's the other way around. Uh, with, uh, with our readings here. So it's almost like the ancients, did they sense this radiation? And, and if they did, why, why is it in the middle? Is it, uh, and why would it be different from the outside to a control? It is truly fascinating. I really do feel that they sense an awful lot of the energy coming out of the ground. And like I show you, I think it was Gaia that gave us the triple spiral uh, through energy patterns that... Uh, I have studied in Guy Underwood's collection. I'm going to move on now to Stanton Drew. So if we just anchor what we've kind of looked at, we've looked at avenues, and we've looked at places where maybe it wasn't uh, where humans walked or humans interacted with. And could that be projected onto an ancient site like Stanton Drew itself? I mean, it really is the, the abode of the goddess. I mean, it's only down the road as well, isn't it? It's very close uh, to go and visit. And it, it is really a wonderful sight. And I feel it does represent uh, the goddess uh, to some regard because it has been noticed that the, the, the large circle, uh, when it comes to the size, if you project it to be uh, the size of the Earth, then the northeast circle is the size of the moon. People like John Martineau have done lots with the northeast circle and saying that it equates to uh, Venus's transits. So I'm not going to be talking about what's been done before, but having a look at uh, uh, Stanton drew through, uh, through the eyes of the, what I believe is the ancients and a long protracted ritual in the sky at the winter solstice. But again, time and time again, when you start looking to the wider environs of, of an ancient site, we have the, the neutral zones where the, the, the energy can be cleared and we've got two really powerful points at Stanton, Stanton Drew, for example. You've got one along the avenue. And if you go there and you feel, put your hands above some of the stones, you can actually feel heat coming out. At Stonehenge, there's a particularly worked stone there, uh, which I call a kind of ridge spine stone, where you really do feel heat coming out of, of that stone. And an archaeologist would uh, tell you, well, some archaeologists at least, that that was a mistake. It was called Broad Tulin, Tulin by uh, Richard Atkinson. But if you imagine deep in the ground, you've got a lot of activity going on. And imagine that you've got an aquifer above an aquifer above an aquifer. And then these meeting points that come together that generates a, a lot of energy. Then what, what we've got with an outlier from Stanton Drew, we've got all of these concentric circles. That's a huge field of energy being pushed out by that stone. And it kind of ripples out and ripples in. Ripples out and ripples in. And that's a, a lot of energy that if you stand and you just feel, you can really feel that, that energy. And it produces concentric circles of, of great power uh, as well and very fast-flowing uh, water beneath the ground. So it's like a meeting point of aquifers. And I've been saying a lot for you know, many, many years now that uh, blind springs that you know, old authors used to talk about uh, many years ago in all probability isn't an underground springhead because when you start to do water divining at those sites with your old-fashioned you know, water 
dry hazel uh, twig, it doesn't do the spin as a, as a blind spring proper. And I've always said that aquifers, and at Avebury, it's now been proved it is a huge aquifer by the water board. But what I say, don't forget, is that water is produced by the earth, not by rainfall. Primary water, or yin water, as I call it, to give the, the honor back to Gaia. And so this water is produced in the earth, and I'm sure all rock planets do that. So we're going to have a look at the, the avenue and how maybe some cir uh, circles were being used. Because at Stanton Drew, you have the northeast circle on lower ground, heading towards the River Chew. Then you have the large, whoops, <laughs> then you have the large uh, stone circle, the great stone circle, the second largest in the world. And on higher ground, you have uh, another circle that was probably later than the others, some say. So you're on high ground here, and you're on low ground down there. So that's what I want you to feel, that you're on elevated ground when you're in that particular stone circle. So we're going to have a look at some lunar alignments now. Uh, and there's been a lot done. And you can have a quick uh, uh, read of this. But basically, there's a lot of uh, lunar alignments. Uh, but our focus is going to be on Alexander Tom. Don't we all love Tom? Isn't it? What would we do without Alexander Tom? I really don't know. So we're going to have a look at Alexander Tom's alignment between the southwest and the northeast circle, which I've got there uh, in blue, and the southern major uh, lunar standstill. Okay, this is the southern one, just like at Avebury. Remember, we had the winter solstice in between the, um, that was the minor uh, southern uh, moonrise there. This is the major here. But it doesn't matter whether it's the minor or the, or the major uh, southern moonrise because it's a well-known fact that during uh, the week of the winter solstice, any southern standstill alignment will coincide with the week of the dark moon. And the dark moon is the last waning thin crescent. Okay, so now we have the week of the winter solstice. And I think the ancients were master astronomers anyway. And just before dawn, uh, before that moment, the winter solstice sunrise comes up. Over three days, don't forget, it's a solstice, a standstill of the sun. Then at dawn, just before the sun does its magical act at the winter solstice, you'll see the last crescent of dark moon come up. And uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful sight. I don't know if uh, you, any of you guys really like to go out and see dark moon. A few of us, yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful sight. So we're at dawn uh, again. And this, to the ancients, in all probability, represented death. It's the last phase uh, of the moon. And there's been a lot of evidence that the ancients were looking into dark moon for, for quite, quite some time, even going back to, you know, like Alexander Marshak, for instance. He notes uh, dark moon a lot. So what happens at this protracted ritual that I'm going to demonstrate, I think, was about the goddess, because it's about the moon and the sun. And it's about balance as well. So I don't think it was all kind of all goddess stuff. And I used to think it was quite simple when I, I wrote my first booklet on the elongated skulls. Oh, it was along came the Bronze Age and they were all sun worshippers. And in the Neolithic, they were all lunar worshippers. I don't think that at all now. I think it was these protracted uh, rituals representing more balance and harmony. The thing I love about Dark Moon, and uh, I, Basti helped me do some photography uh, for this, but the people that lived close to the land, and I don't, I'm a product girl, I'm sorry, <laughs> I do not live close to the land, probably should, but I don't. But all those that do live close to the land, they get up for Dark Moon, they say it calls them. So we were at the sanctuary, uh, arrived there, and all the Dark Mooners were there, and saying they feel the presence of the people of the avenue. And did I know anything about that? I said, yeah, it's the guardians that you feel there. And it comes up, the most beautiful honeycomb and it is really, really uh, a sight to behold. So this is just before the winter solstice sunrise. We see the honeycombed moon come up. 
And this is when I think it was a time of natural thinking about death and regeneration uh, in, in the landscape. And then that will hang around for sort of like one or two days. And I'll show you what happens at Avebury and how you can see the moon change color uh, in its protracted uh, stage of this. But you see, you have the last crescent, dark moon, then you have no moon. It goes jet black. Everything's gone in the sky. And then you wait a couple more days, a new moon, white moon, is often born. So you get, that's at sunset that you see new moon come in the skies, but it's at dawn, the old moon. So it's going from like east to west. And then you have this magical bit where it's dark and there's no moon. And I think that's where in protracted rituals you'd go from death to being back in the womb to rebirth. I'm going to show you as well, like I said at the beginning, how women were being treated in the landscape and becoming goddesses themselves. I don't think it was all about being outside. But anyway, at places like Avery and Stanton Drew, um, you do have uh, the, the dark moon will come up in its uh, honey uh, aspect. And then if you, and I walk my talk, because anthropologists that have been looking into these types of lunar alignments must have done it from their armchairs in Google Earth, because they, they miss everything out. The beauty that you see, how the moon changes color. So imagine you're at the sanctuary. This is where we do dark moons. We look at a dark moon coming up, just before dawn, and it draws the people towards it. And that's what I love. When the moon calls us, she calls us. And so we're at the sanctuary, and I thought, well, what happens if I walk down, and now I go to Avebury, for, for example? Is it going to be the same color? What, what's going to happen? So I walk down the route that I think the ancients took, uh, not down the avenue proper, but by that Faulkner, past the Faulkner ring, and it's changing color as it rises. Is. It's becoming lighter and lighter and lighter till when you do get it somewhere like Avebury or the Temple Shrine area, it's completely white. It's changed. And, and so uh, then, like I say, after that goes to black, you will get the new moon at sunset. And that's the, the cycle of life and death that, that JJ was talking about, but visually seen in the skies above. And the moon does play tricks on the stones as well, as I'm sure that many of you have seen at Avebury. So what does this do to Earth energy? What does the moon's relationship, sister moon, do to Mother Earth? And this has been uh, known research for quite some time. But I'm going to show you Stanton Drew through Earth Energy and why I think it's a goddess temple, unlike Glastonbury and unlike Avebury. Because if we look to Hamish Miller, uh, this is Glastonbury Abbey, obviously here in a wonderful Glastonbury, he said uh, quite a lot of the times the main access, this here is the Mary Current, and it sets the gender of the church, or cathedral, or abbey. So I thought, well, if we project that onto uh, the landscape, what would happen with uh, their ideas? And incidentally, there was two major PowerPoints at the abbey that Hamish didn't really understand, and they, they were these two. See? It's where the energy really forms a, a diamond. And my, my late father, in his book, Doused Him with the Difference, came up with what he thinks that was and doused it with, uh, with Hamish. And it's truly one of the most powerful forms of Earth energy known. Well, that's a bit off a wonk, that photograph, for some reason. <laughs> I have to go in like that way. Uh, so at Stanton Drew, we have the geospiral energy pattern that I've long talked about. So I won't mention that here. And we also have a lot of what uh, Guy Underwood called aquastats. And aquastats, he never really said in his book, The Pattern of the Past, which was the wrong book that went to print, what aquastats were. He said that static, it was a fissure system uh, in, in the land, and aqua, it once had water. So basically, he was saying it's a, it's a fissure. But in my own dowsing, I've doused for longer than Guy Underwood himself now. Where does that time go? Jeez, coming up for the big 6-0 soon. Uh, my sister always said, I don't like O birthdays. I hate O birthdays. 
And uh, so I had to discover that a lot of them were still wet. They had water flowing in them. But this water is the water borne by Gaia in her, in her womb, if you will. It's not rainfall water. And as Underwood discovered, it has an energy field 30 feet up to 15 to 30 feet each side of it. I'll show you this at Avery Avenue, and you get more female energies, earth energies, at Stanton Drew. Stanton Drew is associated with a myth, and the myth of Stanton Drew is that uh, six days uh, after a full moon, the stones walk to the River Chu to have a drink. And that's the, the myth. But I think what they're recalling is ancient water divining and earth energy law. Because if you imagine at the center of most stone circles in the pyramids and uh, Mexico, it was a design canon that the ancients had. And you've got a spiral pattern going around like this, the geospiral, a harmonic pattern of underground yin water. Six days after a new or full moon, it goes in the opposite direction. So I think the, the myth is not about really the river Chu, it's about the sacred uh, river and aquifer that it's beneath. And this has an amazing healing energy field. And what does water have? It has memory, doesn't it? Yeah, water, according to homeopathy, it has memory. So when we're above these geospirals, it can contain the Akashic record of place. Put a bottle of water above it. That's how I make my Avebury and Stonehenge essences. Put a bottle of water above these energy patterns, and that will feed it. So I think, returning to the avenues of either Stanton Drew or Avebury itself, they weren't walking on the male current, Michael, along the West Kennet Avenue. This is one of the uh, surveys done by Guy Underwood himself. Either side, you have these aquastats that the stones are actually sited on, and you have the burials either on the Michael current or slightly off this female energy line. And this is like a geospiral pattern. Above, Underwood says this is a stone 23. He made his own numbering system. It's actually stone 15B, if, if you want a map, and find it at Avebury. So here we have the geospiral, and it's like a pregnant stone. If you look at it on the side, this stone actually looks pre pregnant. And it's been worked by ancient man to have that kind of uh, pregnant uh, belly shape. And if, like I said earlier, we follow what Lethbridge said, Tom Lethbridge, then he said you go for the bionic charge. And the bionic charge on that stone is 100% female. Put a, your hand uh, on the stone, hold a pendulum. This is what uh, Lethbridge did. He used the long cord pendulum of 21 inches uh, for this, but you can just use a short cord uh, pendulum, and it will go uh, counterclockwise for, for female bionic charge and, and the other way for, for male. But it's, it's good to have a bit of you know, fun with uh, Lethbridge's uh, long cord uh, pendulum. So at Stanton Drew, I think the, uh, it's, it's exactly the same. It's all aquastat, all female earth energy currents there. Avebury has Michael and Mary, female water, male water, and it has female vortex energy, male vortex energy. It's all about both genders. Stanton Drew is predominantly female earth energies. I'll just show you this uh, slide of Stonehenge because I'm going to show you how the moon... Uh, how the moon energizes water. What are we? We're water, aren't we? 75% salty water. So if the moon is doing this to the ground, the moon is doing this to us as well. And if we synchronize by going to these ancient sites, I mean, it was, whoops, I'm all arms, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a bit like Tim was saying earlier that you know, human henge, that really touched my heart because what's very close to me is a town called Swindon, I live in Marlborough, and I work very closely with um, the Women's Refuge Centre. It's very close to my heart, I've been a bit of a patron for them for many, many years now, and I take out women freely, I, I never charge, uh, charge them at all, and I take them to these energy spots, a bit like what Tim was saying, and saying, how do you feel at this site? You tell me. And they 
tell me their stories. And as we walk around uh, the landscape, um, we, we feel that they have, like Tim was saying, it changes you. And I have been gifted by Avebury so many times. She is beloved to me. I wear a pre-coinage, a, a mid-Bronze Age money ring. This is before coins came in. She gifted me that. And then when I said to her, I'm taking these women here again, and they're having really trouble with their kids, finding houses to live up. They've been beaten. Uh, they've, you know, they've been through awful, awful circumstances. Uh, and I said, what can I help them with? And within literally three weeks, two spearheads and an arrowhead came to me through Avebury, just through the molehills. Scratch, oh, no touching. It's just scratching through, uh, through the molehills. And I'll show you them. And so we placed these ancient artifacts in their hands and we walk uh, the landscape together. And I tell them, come off, come with me six days after the new or full moon uh, because the, the, the waters are energized. Uh, because it's not, nothing is stagnant in Earth energies. When Hamish did his two-dimensional drawings of Mary and Michael, imagine it's coming up out of the ground, contracting, expanding, and creating energy arches. That's Earth energy. It's not just in, in, in the ground. So we're going to have a look at Guy Underwood's uh, survey of Stonehenge. Uh, this is all female water at Stonehenge, incidentally. I've taken all the remnants lines out. Because it was, I don't know if uh, John Martineau's here, but it was John Martineau that saved all of these surveys from a bonfire and gave them to my dad. Otherwise, we wouldn't know this, this legacy. I mean, how, how amazing is that? That in itself uh, is a story. But what Underwood did, Tom Graves, I'm sure lots of us here have heard about Tom Graves. People are nodding. What a wonderful master dancer. He and the Dragon Project looked at Underwood's work and said, hang on a minute. They're following path lines. They're remnants lines where you walk. So you have to take all of those out, and then you come up with, uh, with the survey. And just by old-fashioned water divining. So I've left some remnants lines in on here to show you. So it was people walking around that, that area, uh, and that's what uh, the other master dowsers have said. But, you know, Guy Underwood, he was a pioneer. So what uh, we're going to have a look at now is we're going to have a look at the lunar influences and Gaia's reaction to the Earth energy. And we can see six days after a new moon, see all the triple spirals? You are entering a, a, a Stonehenge through a triple spiral. It's not just a new Grange. <laughs> it's here in our landscape. A lot of activity. That's when the stones of Stanton Drew started to move and walk around. And if you stand in these energy zones, uh, and it's around about noon is a really good time to work with this. I'm going to show you some of our uh, recordings of the magnetic field uh, on these earth currents. And like Hugh was saying in his talk, there was a spiral energy field. Well, it doesn't surprise me that was uh, in Turkey because all of these spirals here. But at dark moon, uh, towards the, the last quarter, up until the, the new moon proper, it's karma. It's a real calm in time. So you want to be energized. You can go uh, six days after the new moon. Calm is dark moon, that waning moon that I showed you. And also, Earth energy weaves. Women are good at weaving stories and, and, and weaving. And I love the, the idea of, you know, shield maidens, like you get in Viking times, uh, and the women that went to war. And you also had peacemakers in early medieval time. And you had uh, uh, stories of people dancing in and out of the stones. And, and again, Tim was touching about on that with human henge. When I show you some of the Earth energy surveys of Stanton Drew and Boss Carl Wern on, for example, you can see how uh, movement, some of this is remnants lines, but there are some solid earth energy lines there. And they move in and out. See? Weaving in and out. So I think what's going on there is as you're walking through the landscape, you could have been weaving in and out of the uh, stones there. Now, when we have a look at the peak water dragons, energy peaks, and I call them water dragons because Hamish could call them earth dragons, Anything they can do, I can do better. Uh, <laughs> joke. Love them all. Um, 
So here we have uh, the water dragon here, and it peaks at noon, and it peaks at midnight, and then it drops down in its uh, magnetic values. So this is a really good time to work with this sort of uh, Earth energy. And do you know what I feel when I've been on the, on the triple spirals at Stonehenge and Avery's entrance has the same? You just feel regenerated. You just feel that something has come up and cleansed your body water and, and, and you feel really, really good. And like I say, it has changed, just like Tim's work, walking through the landscape with people that need healing. They're not, they're not visitors. They need the love of the stones. I'm going to show you now uh, a little discovery I had in Egypt that I've been talking about because I've been going to Egypt. And uh, it was really uh, amazing when I was at Egypt because I was uh, stepping in the footsteps of Hamish and Paul and Gary and Caroline, wonderful dancers. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could find female and male earth currents going around LA. But I didn't. I kept getting two lines, two lays, and three earth currents. And I was thinking, oh, you know, this is, this is off the scale. But then I thought, Egypt's off the scale. Well, why not? Uh, so uh, I looked into, uh, into this, and uh, it got some other people to verify it. So I called it, you know, Isis, the female one, because that hits a, a chapel to, to Isis, uh, and so on and so forth. So it follows, like, the, the standard symbolism. And also, a lot of master dowsers have looked into what's called an earth chimney. And if you imagine, just like chimneys in a house, ooh, they puff up smoke to the heavens above, they create a very unusual energy pattern every 10 meters across the land mass. And this is what, the, and this is about, research is about 25 years old now. And here we uh, see this energy pattern. And if you imagine that, then it's, quite foxy to douse because it, it, you can confuse this with a lot of concentric circles like I've shown you before or, or the geospiral proper. But I thought, you know, as we're coming to the end of the presentation, I'd like to take you somewhere really exotic where master dowsers have done a, a lot of uh, energy work other than the places that you normally hear about. So we're going to go to Bali now and we're going to meet uh, some vortex uh, energy there. And also these master dowsers that studied Bali for decades, actually, uh, they thought that wherever you get earth currents, meet another form of energy, they arch. Just like all of those uh, spiral patterns uh, I showed you. So this is one of uh, their temples in, in Bali that we looked at. And, uh, and we doused, and it creates arcs of, of energy. And they measured this by putting a kind of copper up into the air, so to speak, to see if they could get the same frequency that was flowing through. So, uh, and again, this is a three earth current system, not just a two one that we're used to seeing. And this was independent of, of my research, but it verified that I was probably on the right track with ancient Egypt. And also, if we personify uh, energy and we look at these temples, you have a terrifying witch goddess. And she looks ferocious. And, uh, and like JJ was showing earlier, she has her, you know, her big booze, but she has her tongue sticking out. And you look, whoa, she's quite scary looking. And she's associated with the underworld. And wherever you get this association of a powerful woman deity, then you will get, for example, this vortex type of uh, energy uh, here. And it, it is an eight-armed vortex energy field that really spins round and round, uh, and it's constant. I think the next slide doesn't show that. There, here's the energies coming in, and I'm going to show you now what, how a vortex affects an entire temple space like the ones in Bali. It's massive, and it's always in an unassuming place, and it just spreads its energy out uh, continually. And there happened to be a guru here uh, this day, and he was asking what we're doing, and why are we you know, dousing vortex energy? and talking about an eight-armed goddess that was there. This has got uh, eight arms. And we were saying this is how Gaia is producing the energy in your temple. And he had tears in his eyes and said, you found her, you found her. I've always felt this uh, here. So, th so that, was, that was a wonder. 
But just before I'm coming to the end of 15, I want to say about women, prehistoric women becoming goddesses in the landscape. Because men, uh, from 2000 BC, men were put into round barrows, centrally positioned as, a individual, as an individual, often with grave goods like the Bushman, the Boscan Bowman, uh, and all of that. So they were put, put in here. Women weren't. Uh, the, what was being found is that you have token burials of women. And what they mean by a token burial is they were picking bits of women's bones out and they weren't burying the full body of, of a woman. Of, uh, you know, perhaps she was a priestess, perhaps she was a healer, perhaps she was a lovely mum. <laughs> what, whatever. They were not burying a whole woman in the landscape. In fact, some of the bones they found were being moved around the landscape for up to 500 years before they were put back into the ground. And they're always in liminal positions, guardian entrances of the triple spiral and, and places like that. So the way I see it, and, and anthropologists do uh, in this landscape, is that women were much more broader. They were a part of the ceremonies. They, they weren't absent. They were a part of it all, always present. So maybe the goddess uh, in the Bronze Age was once a living woman that they knew, and she became what's called a individual to anthropologists because she's a part of the landscape, she's a part of something bigger, and the men were, were never created and taken out of, of the landscape. So I think that's very poignant that you know women were being treated very, very differently in, in the Bronze Age. Their memories were never forgotten. It's gonna skip that uh, DNA report to, uh, to focus uh, on this. So we have uh, the death and the rebirth of the, of the dark moon that I showed you. And we also have the death and the rebirth of anything in the ancient world. For, for example, the, some of those bones that were being moved around the landscape in rituals, women present, that died long ago. I find that absolutely incredible. What they did, they ground this bone down as well, really fine powder. Yeah, and they put grooves into their beakerware, yeah, like grooves, and then they put the bones into the pot so that they were carried and you'd be eaten out of your, literally, your ancestors' uh, bones. And I've handled this pottery at uh, Oxford and places, and it is really very powerful uh, in its own right. It's like it's living still, pottery still living. And they would do the same with bronze. They would deliberately break uh, artifacts uh, bronze artifacts and put them in watery places, not in the earth, but in water. And so you get a, a Bronze Age sword and they would bend it like this and put it in a, in a lake. And that's where Francis Priors thinks the Lady of the Lake mythology came from. It's from the Bronze Age and uh, it, the, the sword is in the water. And, and same uh, with, with other myths uh, as well. So the women never died. That's uh, the point uh, of this talk, and at Dark Moon, what I think was happening was they were there, uh, in their power, in their death, and this is the pottery that contained uh, human bone, probably a uh, female with a, with a sun motif uh, there as well. So again, no death. And I'm putting the uh, inside of the pot to the camera uh, to show you that also the pots were lined with bone, especially the uh, urns that uh, ashes went into or bits of burnt bone. So they were lined with their ancestors' bone. Those that went before, those that went before were never forgotten uh, in the Bronze Age. And I'd, I like to, to end this talk by saying, I really feel that there was equality uh, in the Bronze Age with male and female. I don't think it was all a goddess thing or all, all a male thing, and that they were coming together and living more uh, in harmony. And what I like about uh, the Bronze Age people is that uh, they never forgot who they were. And sometimes I think we have forgotten who we are, and we need to remember uh, those that went before us. Thank you for listening.